Well, it's done. Never doing this again. Apple has been receiving praise from just about everyone for their new Apple Silicon Macs, from the iMac to MacBook Pro. However, this approval, it's newfound. Uh, lest you forget, just a few years ago, Apple was plagued with hardware reliability issues on the MacBook Pro. There were tons of form over function design failures on both their laptops and desktops. Thermals? <laughs> Give me a break. And there was just a convoluted, confusing lineup. Many products that stepped on each other, it was a mess. And Apple was receiving average reviews from publications that typically are very in favor of their products. The Mac was not in a good place. And many people, myself included, we had to turn to other solutions because Apple's offerings, they just weren't sufficiently compelling. A large number of defectors turned to the Hackintosh a bog standard PC with a custom UEFI bootloader that would allow the machine to run or boot into Mac OS. Now, working with them was a bit of a nightmare initially, but it quickly turned into a community with extensive support for a wide range of hardware, including heavily modified kernels to support platforms unsupported by Apple, like AMD Ryzen. In fact, the Hackintosh community was so thriving that I attribute much of my own channel's growth, Snazzy Labs, to the large number of Hackintosh builds that I did. They still remain some of my most viewed videos to date. But Apple Silicon, it is a true, it's a paradigm shift. I mean, not only has it marked the beginning of the end for x86 Mac OS support, and subsequently the Hackintosh, but it, it raises a really important question, and it's one that hasn't been asked in nearly 20 years. Are Apple computers more performant than PCs of equivalent price? Now that's a pretty loaded question, but I'm going to try to answer it, which necessitates the building of a Hackintosh. What is likely my last Hackintosh? Look, given that laptops are notoriously difficult to Hackintosh successfully, and Apple's new M1 Pro and M1 Max have yet to make it into desktop computers, allowing for a truly fair fight, we're sticking to the nearly one-year-old M1 system on chip. More specifically, I've selected the M1 Mac Mini as it's the closest Apple's to Apple's headless desktop competitor. Now, the Mac Mini starts at a shockingly low $699 and, and can often be found for $100 less than that. However, that comes with a paltry 256 gig SSD that's hardly usable for normal people and Apple charges through the nose for more storage capacity. So we have selected to use the one terabyte model that pushes our price point on the Mac mini to just over $1,000. And this serves as both an actually practical Mac mini configuration, but it also provides a reasonably equivalent budget to build our PC. Now the Hackintosh landscape is kind of weird at the moment, given that Apple is rapidly abandoning newer generation Intel chips. The only recent Hackintosh supported iGPUs are found on the 10th generation Intel chips, which are now nearing a year and a half on the market. Now newer AMD Ryzen chips, those do work. However, AMD Hackintoshes tend to have a number of issues out of the box that are conveniently left out when pitching benchmark scores on YouTube videos like this one. Some of these issues, like Adobe App Support, which most people want, can be ironed out, but there are a lot of other issues that just basically can be fixed. Uh, support for hardly any VM is a no-go, and pro audio tools are also not really going to work. So we've decided to stick to Intel, more specifically the Intel i9-10850K. Why this chip? Well, because it's actually still quite excellent, but also because it's one of the most recent chips officially supported in Mac OS. And the internal graphics work, which allow us to forego a dedicated GPU, which are even more stupidly expensive than they were just a few months ago when we thought they couldn't get even pricier. <laughs> for example, I bought two AMD Vega 64s on eBay exactly two years ago for $230 each. Today, those same cards are going for more than $500 a piece. It's insanity. Now that CPU is going into a Gigabyte Aorus Z590i Mini ITX motherboard. And for the rest of the parts, well, we kind of just used what we had laying around the office. 
money's really tight lately. <clears throat> Mac, OS, Mac OS doesn't really play nicely with the network card on this motherboard or in hardly any modern, modern motherboard. So I've swapped it out with a Broadcom chip that was actually used in older MacBook Pro models, which allows for airdrop, handoff, sidecar, and, and all the other niceties that you really come to expect from a Mac. Can I just say, with these newer motherboards that have heat sinks and fascias and a bunch of other crap strapped to them, they are so much harder to take apart. Why? Most of this isn't even functional, it's just aesthetic. But that's neither here nor there. For the SSD, I used a one terabyte Samsung 980 Pro. Now this is a PCIe 4 drive, I'm just running it at PCI 3 speeds. Uh, this is a drive that's only partially supported in macOS. Trim is not supported, which is kind of less than ideal for long-term usage, but for the purposes of this video, it's more than fine. I also used a low-profile Noctua NHL9 CPU cooler. That's right, brown thunder, baby. <laughs> and last, we've got RAM. Uh, boring. I got 32 gigs of high-speed DDR4 memory clocked at 3600 megahertz, and then we've got a 450 watt power supply. Here is a very similar build, weighing in just below our 1100 build price target. Now, you'll know that I haven't accommodated for a case, and that's because, well, you should buy a practical case, but I have one that I wanted to build in that's not practical, because it's too expensive and it's ridiculous, but I cannot show it to you. It's here, it's in this box. <laughs> I know that doesn't really sound possible, but it's true. This is the Teenage Engineering Computer One. Now I'm sure you've seen Teenage Engineering stuff. They started making synthesizers and now they're kind of like this hot design firm that everyone wants to work with. They, uh, they helped design the Playdate handheld game console and they've even worked with Ikea. This case is crazy. It comes as flat pack powder coated aluminum sheets and following a manual, you actually bend the case to form. Now in theory, this actually sounds like a really cute idea. In practice, it's a hellish nightmare. You see, the sheet metal is just really thin and I'm sure they do that to make it easy to bend, but it's subsequently just not very sturdy. <laughs> and many of the panels came completely warped out of the box. And it's hard to get them back to shape. Now, slowly but surely, the case did start to come together and the instructions were easy enough to follow, but they did leave out a fair bit of information. For example, the case supports an intake fan on the side, but nowhere on the website or in the manual does it specify the size of that fan. It's 80 millimeters, by the way. But it also, they don't give you any mounting screws for the fans and, and the pre-drilled holes that are there are hilariously small for any fan screw that I've ever heard of, which forced me to bore uh, basically holes out of them with a drill and then use Noctua's little rubbery isolation standoff things. <laughs> But that's not even the half of it because other design choices seem confusing at best. There is just one front panel USB type C connector, but Teenage Engineering opted to use the slow, old, bulky USB 3.0 motherboard header. I don't know why. Uh, they should have used the newer, better, faster, more commonplace now uh, USB 3.1 header. They didn't. Additionally, the wiring that they used for the front switch which I must admit is actually very cute and, and better than a power button. You've convinced me, Fine. As well as the wiring for the headphone jack. It's just downright silly. So on the headphone jack, pretty much every case in the last friggin' million years, not that long, but a long time, have used HD audio connectors that plug right into your motherboard. Well, on this case, they just used three headers labeled T, R, and S. I found after a while that there is tiny, tiny printing on the PCB itself that those pins are for right channel, left channel, and ground. Then you have to consult your motherboard manual in hopes that they actually list what each pinout does. And once you've figured it out, then you can wire it up to the TRS connectors, which are actually in a different order, RTS. <laughs> Cool. But look, none of that is as bad as the worst part of this, and that is, well, freaking putting the case together, because none of the panels are tapped to accept screws. Yes, that's right. It's just a hole with spray paint in it, and they don't even include a tap in the box. 
So begins the process of painstakingly shaving metal off of every single hole with one of the included screws, a screwdriver, and a lot of arm strength. Now, when the case is finally together, it's actually pretty cool looking. But at $200, it is outlandishly expensive. And the size of the case, well, cute, is stupid. Because it's way too big for uh, a case without a GPU. But the GPU size that it accommodates is ridiculous. You will not fit any modern small form factor GPU in here. And so, yeah, I don't really know what this was designed for. <laughs> it could be great if they accommodated for a larger GPU or made the case physically smaller. If they had pre-tapped holes, what an innovation, uh, slightly heavier gauge of metal so that, that I couldn't do this. I should probably put that back. The thing just bends. <laughs> it's, it's just no resistance whatsoever. Uh, and then, you know, if they shaved, I don't know, $130 off the price tag, 70% discount. I like teenage engineering. I like the idea of this. Don't buy it. It's bad. But this was hardly the difficult part. The Hackintosh was the part that sucked. <laughs> and the Hackintosh scene has changed a lot over the last couple of years. Clover, which was the bootloader I've used in most of my videos that saw usage really during the Hackintosh boom, it's now passe and OpenCore has taken its spot. Now, the theoretical benefits to OpenCore are actually quite massive and quite numerous. For example, you can use system integrity protection and FileVault. It boots the machine much faster. It loads Kex more reliably. It plays much more nicely with Windows partitions if you're hoping to dual boot. The list goes on. While I've talked about OpenCore in the past, it's been in the creation of AMD Hackintoshes. This was my first Intel build on OpenCore, and holy freaking crap, it was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> now, I must give props to the OpenCore install guide. It is very good. It explains what stuff does and what you need to do, which is way better than Clover's documentation ever was, which is great because it arms you with the knowledge to figure out what went wrong when something goes wrong. But a lot of stuff went wrong. <laughs> and I spent like... Oh, two days straight, maybe three, trying to get this stupid machine to work. From forums to Discord chats and more. Now, I did eventually get it figured out. And I must say that the install now is pretty much perfect, way better than your average Clover install, which had a bunch of weird little quirks and things that could never really seem to be ironed out. But it was hardly a piece of cake and not for the faint of heart. Oh yeah, so this entire process from the case to the OS was kind of a nightmare. And I said my fair share of naughty words. So I dubbed this machine Obscene Tangerine. Do you know where I don't say naughty words though? At least not out loud, only in my head? Meetings. <laughs> uh, meetings are usually boring and they take forever, but today's sponsor, Candow, makes them way better and it propels virtual work forward with their new lineup of meeting cameras. Many of us have been in meetings with lousy conference cameras where it's hard to see and hear everyone. Now, the Candow Meeting Pro, it's a standalone Android device, which is cool because it doesn't require a connected PC. And though you can interface with it with a mouse and keyboard, you don't have to because their excellent remote has gyroscopic cursor support, which is pretty cool. Installing and starting conference software, it, it's a breeze because it's just Android. And these two 180 degree wide angle lenses give a complete view of everyone in the room. With impressive AI algorithms, participants don't need to squeeze together as everyone is viewable on screen. And their eight professional grade microphones can reach voices up to five and a half meters away and accurately beamform those microphones to the individual speaking in the room for noise reduction and echo cancellation. It's really pretty cool. Furthermore, the Candow Meeting Pro has an array of powerful speakers that will fill the meeting room with premium sound. No more crappy TV speakers required. The Candow Meeting and Meeting S can hit tighter equipment budgets while still offering many of the same features if that's something that interests you. For virtual meetings, these things are a no-brainer and so much more enjoyable than many of the hodgepodge conferencing solutions that most of us have been stuck with since the beginning of COVID-19. Check out the Candow Meeting Pro and Candow's other cameras at the links in the video description. Now that the machine is up and running, we return to the question originally proposed at the beginning of the video. 
are Apple computers now more performant than PCs of equivalent price? Well, there's no better way to check that than by running benchmarks and real-world tests. In what should be a surprise to no one that knows the M1, single-core performance on the Mac Mini is off the charts and beats the x86 processor in pretty much any single-core workload. Now, while the 8-core chip does put up impressive numbers relative to its power draw, multi-core tasks, well, that's really where the M1 is going to hit its limitations. The chip only has four performance cores, and when stacked up against Intel's 10-core desktop CPU, it's quite literally no match. Furthermore, this also ignores the very easy overclock that we could apply to the Hackintosh system to push those numbers even further. So we did, and these are the results. Now, a couple of you are gonna be rotating your phones, getting ready to type out an angry comment saying, this is unfairly slighted against the M1 because now the M1 Pro and the M1 Max exist. And I would say, well, price tag, those machines are much more expensive than this little Hackintosh, but fine, I will include them in the benchmarks as well. And you can see that, yeah, while they close the divide significantly, they too come up short. So then what the heck? Have YouTube reviewers been lying to you about how insane Apple Silicon chips are this whole time? Well, no, because when utilized properly in specific workloads, they actually are quite a feat to behold. In DaVinci Resolve 17, an Apple Silicon specific processing engine gives the M1 the leg up in a number of scenarios, amongst which H.265 hardware encoding, which puts Intel's QuickSync engine pretty much to rest. And in Final Cut Pro, working with ProRes yields significantly closer results than those initial benchmarks would lead you to believe. The where the M1 really shines, at least relative to the Intel machine, is, well, pretty much any workload involving graphical compute. Because while not impressive relative to a dedicated GPU, for an integrated GPU, it is mighty good. Looking at the Unigen Heaven benchmark, you might be thinking, holy crap, that's not that much better than I thought it was going to be. Not only is it using OpenGL as a layer built on top of metal, but it's also not a native binary and it's using Rosetta for translation. In a native application, Affinity Photo, the M1 GPU's unified memory architecture and on-chip bandwidth puts the Intel CPU to shame. And while you might say, ah, bah, put any modern GPU inside the PC and the story changes, uh, not so. As Affinity developers have stated that, for example, the M1 Max outperforms a significantly more expensive, power-hungry W6900X GPU in the same benchmark. These types of scenarios are where Apple Silicon really excels. Another one, machine learning. The object detection model benchmark that we made in Create ML to see if people were wearing masks used uh, 100 images in the training model at 5,000 epics and a 32 item batch size. And while the results are, <laughs> holy freaking crap, it puts the Intel to shame with nearly double the performance. Now, look, I don't wanna continue to harp on that, which has probably already been preached by most tech reviewers ad nauseum, but it is absolutely impressive how quietly the Mac Mini handles all of these tasks. And that is in part to total power drop. Power drop from the wall when running these tests is <laughs> bananas. I mean, the M1 is substantially lower than the i9. And the performance delta when the i9 has the leg up, which is not, every case, as we just mentioned, is almost always smaller than the delta in power draw differences. It really is impressive how efficient these machines are. So now we yet again return to the question that I have not answered, but now asked three times. Are Apple computers more performant than PCs of the equivalent price? Well, the answer is no, but it's also yes. <laughs> as you might've expected, people's workloads they're not all the same, go figure. And different hardware excels at different tasks differently. <laughs> but the fact that a modern budget Mac, a Mac mini can outperform a recent near flagship desktop consumer CPU at anything is noteworthy. And knowing M1 frequently outperforms this modern desktop CPU is praiseworthy. I'm not here to claim that modern Macs are the end-all be-all of computing. They, they aren't. However, they are at minimum competent at just about everything. 
and they excel at many things. That's something that couldn't have been said a couple of years ago. And, and their price to performance ratio is now competitive enough that in no way, shape or form can I recommend making a Hackintosh. They, ju they just don't make sense anymore. And the minor performance improvements here and there that you might get are not worth the litany of downside and hours that you're going to spend getting one close to stable. Obscene Tangerine, it's my last Hackintosh. But this isn't my last video. <laughs> you like that transition. So you should get subscribed. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a like. If you didn't, sure, hit the button that you don't know how many dislikes there are. I know, because YouTube's trying to protect creators. I'm not getting into that right now. The video's over. Thank you for watching. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. See you next year. No, I'll be back next week. Stay snappy.